Hi, I'm Philip Anthony Albertelli, and welcome to The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. This is episode four, part two, The Shroud of Turin Spectacular. Despite the cheeky name, I actually do have a kind of reverence for the Shroud. Um, Episode 4, Part 1 was originally supposed to be devoted to the Shroud of Turin. But because I had wanted to cover a last-minute news story, um, most of our time got gobbled up, so I decided to break the episode into two parts so the second half could be purely devoted to the Shroud. Before I get into the history and scientific testing of the Shroud, I want to talk a little bit about my own feelings and experiences. As I've mentioned before on the show, I was raised Roman Catholic, so I was aware of the Shroud from a rather early age, given that such a sacred artifact among Christians and Catholics in particular I can even remember one of my older brothers, who is probably always the most religious among us, used to keep an image of the shroud tucked into his mirror. And I remember seeing it as a, a little kid and being kind of fascinated and afraid of it. I also have a strange, vivid memory of being little, maybe elementary school age, could be early middle school and watching a rerun of that old Leonard Nimoy show in search of, I don't know if any of you remember it. Um, It was kind of a a great show for people who have a fascination with the occult, the supernatural, that sort of thing. And they did a special on the Shroud. So I feel like it's kind of been imprinted into my psyche for quite some time now. I think one of the key things that makes the mystery of the Shroud of Turin so enduring is the fact that it can't be easily written off as compared to maybe some other um, miracles or artifacts. Some experts might disagree with me on that point, especially when it comes to the carbon dating. But I think one thing that makes the Shroud different from religious artifacts is the fact that Whenever a scientist comes forth with evidence or a theory that seems to disprove the Shroud, another expert or scientist on the other side, a proponent, will come up with reasons for why the Shroud may still be valid. It's funny, I've noticed kind of a change in myself. When I was younger, uh, maybe in my teens and early to mid-twenties, and still wrestling with that loss of God and trying to find some way that I could still believe. I think I used to look to the Shroud as a possible hope that maybe someone could still prove to me that there may be a a God or that there's um, something to all this religion stuff. Um, But I've noticed as I've gotten older and now that I've been a non-believer, atheist, um, choose your label, for a while. I notice myself, and I have to be intellectually honest with myself, almost doing a, um, a 180, and in a bizarre way, I find myself on watching documentaries on the shr- Shroud or whatnot, almost hoping that they don't prove it to be real. Maybe that's a part of me saying I've been doing this... Um, non-believer thing for so long that I have something invested in it that I'm afraid to uh, lose or be proven wrong, which is kind of funny because that's sometimes my criticism of religious people is that um, their worldview and so much of their identity um, is informed by their religious beliefs. That I think they sometimes get defensive because they, if they were to be proven wrong, it would kind of pierce and shatter their core or it would make them reevaluate everything. 
Um, but I think it's a good and humbling lesson. I have to look at myself and say, why am I wishing for it not to be true? Um, as a non-believer and someone who, as I discussed last time, I'm a non-believer because that's where my reason has led me to and not because I desire to be part of some organization or a group or adhere to someone else's dogma. So I should be objective as possible and let the facts do the talking. And who knows, there might still be a small part of me, the uh, young Catholic child in me that maybe still wants to believe and, and hopes that the shroud thing will pan out. Maybe there's some dueling forces or some tension in there. I know I'm kind of speaking as if I'm taking for granted that you already know about the Shroud and what it is exactly. So this would probably be a good time to stop and give you at least a general idea of exactly what it is. The Shroud of Turin is a rectangular linen cloth thought by believers to be the burial shroud of Christ. Under normal conditions, you can see a faint brownish or sepia-colored image of a man. And actually, if you unfold the shroud completely, you can also see the back of the figure. So the, head, the heads of the front and back image are almost touching. And the idea is that supposedly, um, if you were to listen to believers, the cloth had wrapped the body of Christ and most likely during the resurrection, there was some miraculous release of energy or some kind of radiation that left an impression or image of the body that it had wrapped on both the front and the back. Now, if you're not religious or if you're a skeptic who's not familiar with the shroud, you might be thinking, wow, it's a cloth with a faint image on it. But where the story really gets interesting is in relatively recent history. I say relatively because we're talking about 1898. In that year, an Italian photographer by the name of Secundo Pia had taken a um, picture or pictures of the shroud. And when he looked while well, developing the photos, when he looked at a negative image on reverse photographic plate, he was pretty much blown away by what he saw. And soon it's safe that the rest of the world would be blown away as well. Because um, what he saw in the negative was not the faint image you see with the naked eye, but a very more detailed image of a man. Um, details of the face, details of, let's say, for argument's sake, it was Christ. Um, we know about the story of the scourging and the uh, brutal treatment um, leading up to the crucifixion. And supposedly you can see all those little details. Um, I know one expert, I believe uh, a Dr. Zuckerby, um, who's done a lot of research into crucifixions and the shroud, uh, what kind of wounds would have been inflicted. He uh, theorized that the wounds on the shroud, some of the dumbbell shaped wounds on the shroud may have been made by a Roman weapon known as a flagrum. Um, basically a type of flail with um, tiny dumbbell weights at the end to kind of in increase the uh, pain and injury to the uh, sufferer. I remember watching a special on the Shroud. I've seen many of them over the years, usually on the History Channel or maybe um, Discovery or the Learning Channel, usually uh, around Easter time. And uh, Dr. Zugaby had held up, uh, I don't know if it was an actual uh, Roman flagrum or a reproduction, but he held the dumbbell uh, weights up to the markings on the shroud or a reproduction of the shroud. Uh, I doubt he had access to the real thing. And they supposedly lined up perfectly. But if you're 
interested in seeing what I'm talking about, the difference between the faint image that's visible at the naked eye versus the detailed negative image, you could easily Google or use whatever search engine you want and do a search for the Shroud of Turin. And uh, I'm sure you can find a plethora of images. So while viewing the negative, uh, as I said, you, you could see a lot of details of supposed wounds, um, a series of you know, little lacerations from the uh, crown of thorns, um, the supposed flagrum injuries, um, blood streaks. And an interesting thing is the... Uh, almost as if in an attempt at modesty, or maybe it was uh, um, a conventional burial pose, I don't know, supposedly. Uh, the arms are downward and crossed to you know, obscure the pelvic re region, basically. And the thumbs aren't really visible, uh, which some people think is a weird thing, but it's been speculated that uh, and this is a point of debate in general, I think, about crucifixion. It's gone back and forth over the years, I believe. Some people think that um, the Romans would have driven nails through the hands. Other people speculate the wrists. And as gruesome as it is, you know, supposedly if you were to just nail through the hands, there'd be too much weight for the hands to support, and the nails would literally rip through the hands and cause the body to flop forward. Um, so a lot of people have speculated that the Romans may have driven the nails through the wrists. Um, but even then, we don't know for sure, because it could also be the case that supposedly the Romans sometimes tied people to crosses, and it could have been a combination of tying and um, driving nails through uh, the extremities. So it's possible that they could have driven nails through the hands and then use the ropes as added support. Uh, who knows? And if you look at artwork throughout the centuries, um, Sometimes you see it through the hands, sometimes the wrists. And uh, this is kind of going off on a different topic, but this kind of leads into um, the debate about the val validity of uh, a phenomenon known as stigmata, which you've probably heard of, where believers will almost get uh, sympathetic wounds that are supposed to mirror those of Christ. And sometimes the believers will supposedly bleed from the hands, sometimes from the wrists. Well, which was the uh, which is the accurate portrayal, if any? Um, but as far as the Shroud of Turin goes, it appears that the injuries are in the wrists, and I believe this is also from Doctor Zugaby, where he's talked about if you were to crucify someone, if you were to drive a nail through the wrist, the uh, damage to the median nerve would cause the thumb to tuck inward, which could explain why the thumbs aren't really visible on the shroud. And it's funny, as I mentioned earlier, it's a uh, relic that's not, or supposed miracle that's not easily explained away, at least not as uh, much so as, as other ones. Say uh, a bleeding statue, maybe, you know, you could uh, go into uh, a church or a shrine and maybe see where the tubes in the bat inside the statue lead up to slits in the eye under the eyes. Or if it's stigmata, you could catch someone who's self-inflicting wounds or smearing blood onto the back of their hands or something like that. Um, but the shroud is really kind of unique and tricky in a way that uh, an expert will come up with a reason why it's invalid or why it's it can be proven to be a hoax. And then an expert on the opposite side will come up with a counter argument. And we're talking about actual scientists, not um, quacks or blind religious devotees desperate to believe. Although it can't be ruled out that even scientists can 
be religious or have religious yearnings under the surface that might in some way um, color their thinking or subconsciously point them in certain directions. There's been a lot of debate over the proportions of the image on the shroud. Shortly after the discovery of the negative image, after the photography done by Secundo Pia, I think it was in 1902, that a uh, professor of, a French professor of comparative anatomy declared that the image was anatomically flawless, um, argued that the fit features of rigor mortis, wounds and blood flow were evidence that the image was formed either um, by coming into direct or indirect contact with an actual corpse. And that kind of leads into um, supposed but unproven theories, uh, as a lot of the theories about the Shroud are unproven, that it could have been a medieval forgery involving the use of an actual corpse. I've heard critics say that the proportions of the shroud are off, um, perhaps things like the arms too long, the uh, legs too short, and proponents have um, counter-argued that that actually adds to the validity of the shroud, that the reason why the arms look long and maybe the legs look short uh, has to do with the pose of the body that it could have been due to rigor mortis or something like that or the knees could have been somewhat bent so therefore the image would look a little distorted because the body wouldn't have been uh, lying completely flat another hallmark in the history of the shroud and its recent history was in 1978 uh, when the church allowed a research team to examine the shroud, uh, the team was known as the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or also known by the acronym STIRP. Part of their job was to not only scientifically investigate the shroud to um, try to determine its validity, um, but also to look for means of scientific preservation because the older the shroud is the more it's exposed to air and light the more the already faint image on the shroud uh, becomes even fainter and the fear is that it someday if not protected the image could disappear altogether whether you're a believer or even if you're not and you want to just see it preserved for posterity. Um, the, the good news is that I believe as of now it's kept in a hermetically sealed glass case that's supposed to minimize the aging and fading process. The Shroud of Turin research project came to the conclusion that the shroud in fact didn't appear to be a forgery and that the image did not appear to be created um, by paint or other artistic medium. That finding was um, debated, however. I believe it was shortly after uh, Sterp actually provided um, a Dr. William McCrone with uh, samples and he determined that he thought the image actually had been formed of paint and I believed he actually came to the conclusion that the image was formed of paint pigment um, particularly vermilion and I believe red ochre which were common uh, medieval paint pigments. I should stop to mention that one of the members of STIRP was a, a scientific photographer by the name of Barry Schwartz. And um, I always loved watching him in interviews, and I've seen him on a lot of documentaries about the Shroud. And uh, I think as he would describe it, and I'm paraphrasing, that since he's Jewish, he feels that he doesn't really 
particularly have a dog in the race, um, or is it dog in the hunt and horse in the race? Mixing up my metaphors. <laughs> anyway, uh, but he's still a proponent. He just believes from his own research and what he what he's witnessed. He doesn't think that the image um, had been forged or that it's the result of some kind of artistic medium. I remember I actually had correspondence with Barry Schwartz years ago. I had been watching a special about the Shroud uh, that he was in, he had been interviewed for, and one of his colleagues, a uh, female scientist, had a theory that I thought sounded a little wacky. Um, she had speculated that she thought that the shroud was artistically made, that it, it was created by someone while the body of Jesus was still in the tomb, actually sitting there by candlelight or lantern, lan lantern light or whatever, and actually sketching an image of the corpse that they were viewing out of reverence, I suppose, onto the cloth. And I said, I mean, just on face value, that sounds a little weird, but my big problem with it was that uh, first century Jews were strongly forbidden to create graven images, um, to create representations of uh, living creatures, especially the human body. So I don't know why the heck a uh, first century Jew would have had the impulse to sit down and start sketching a corpse. It, it doesn't make sense on a lot of levels. But he was a good guy, and he actually replied to my correspondence, and he was kind of a chivalrous or a stand-up guy, and even uh, stood up for his colleague a little, even though he had said that he basically agreed with me. And that reminds me of something else I want to mention when I had decided to do a special on the Shroud of Turin, uh, you, you know, I started playing this last week. I think um, it was a, a day or two afterwards that I had seen a story on the Huffington Post about a Shroud uh, book that's supposed to be coming out tomorrow, I, I believe. Um, as I record this now, it's March 31st, uh, just for a point of reference. And... The supposed theory of this um, book, I think the author was an art historian, and this is really weird, too. Uh, he had a theory that the shroud uh, image developed by some explainable earthly mechanism and that it was the shroud that inspired the Jesus movement or early Christianity that, you know, it, it had... Uh, the image developed by normal means, and then people saw the shroud and became inspired, and that's what spurred Christianity. Uh, that seems a little nutty to me and, and highly unlikely to be provable. 1988 was a big year for the shroud because um, some carbon dating tests had been run on it, and the conclusion was that the samples tested dated back to only 1260 to 1390 AD, which would have placed the shroud um, into the Middle Ages and a long ways down the road from uh, the first century, obviously. And you probably would have thought, well, that's the end of it. Case closed. Um, it's been proven to date back to the Middle Ages and so it can't possibly be the burial shroud of Christ. But like I said, one of the interesting things about the shroud is its ability to survive skeptical arguments. And, and uh, it wasn't just religious proponents who were trying to justify the carbon dating results. We're talking about actual scientists who claim that um, the samples that had been tested from the shroud may have thrown the carbon dating results off. It's thought that um, 
smoke damage from a fire that the shroud survived or um, all the handling over the centuries could have contaminated the samples and caused a more recent carbon dating result and that possibly it still could have dated back to the first century. And there's a lot of argument and debate back and forth. Scientists arguing that the carbon dating uh, result could have indeed been skewed. Others saying that the carbon dating um, was probably correct, that it was at least of ballpark accuracy. And supposedly the people providing the samples uh, claim that they came from an area of the cloth where there could have been a lot of handling or uh, smoke damage or where the shroud could have been repaired uh, following some minor damage uh, from the fire I had mentioned. But the people who did the carbon dating, on the contrary, claim that it came from a uh, relatively healthy middle area of the shroud where there'd be uh, a, light, a less likely chance of contamination. While we're on the controversial topic of the Shroud's age, I should probably stop to mention that it first appears in mainstream history um, right around 1390, which would put it in the uh, ballpark area of the carbon dating results. The Shroud does have a supposed history prior to 1390 um, that's controversial and it, it involves uh, scholars and others trying to get the uh, Shroud back to stretch its history backwards as close as possible to the first century so it can be more provable to be the actual burial cloth of Christ. I know some have speculated that it might be one and the same with another religious um, artifact known as the Mandelian. And uh, I think, uh, don't quote me on it, but I, I believe Mandelian translates roughly to something like little towel or a face cloth, something like that. And there's... Um, medieval artwork of a holy relic, uh, a rectangular relic uh, with an oval cut out in the middle where a face can be seen through it. And it's speculated that that may have been the Shroud of Turin folded up so just the face was exposed. And that dates back uh, before 1390. So that's one way in which people try to get it to date earlier. And there was also not that long ago, um, some scientists did some uh, pollen testing on the shroud. And they thought that they found not only pollen samples, but images of ancient flowers um, on the shroud that you know, the flowers could have been spread around the body as a show of respect after death and that those outlines um, perhaps match species of flowers that were around in the uh, first century Middle East. So it's interesting. You see how it keeps on going back and forth. As for the mechanism of how the image was formed, like I said, believers... Um, tend to usually put forward the proposition that it was caused by the lighter energy of the resurrection. Um, some skeptics have produced some decent results uh, through different methods. Um, one way was by creating a bar relief, basically creating like a, a shallow sculpture of a face or a body and then draping a cloth over it, and then basically cooking it. And the result is you get this kind of brownish burnt image of the sculpture that's left on the cloth, on the finished product. I've seen other people do tests where they um, 
said it could have been formed by an early form of medieval photography by hanging up a cloth and doing some kind of trick with lenses and uh, light exposure to um, eventually get a image to develop on a cloth. Uh, how reasonable that is, I don't know. I think if I remember the documentary I watched, they were capable of forming some kind of image when they tried to reproduce the uh, supposed mechanism or technique. Like I was saying, there was some debate over whether the image was formed by paint or by other means. And uh, some proponents of the shroud have argued that the supposed uh, microscopic uh, bits of vermilion and red ochre weren't enough to constitute an image on its own, and they may have been left by devout pilgrims pressing um, cloths up against the shroud in an attempt to try to make some kind of copy or make a keepsake or something like that. And uh, paint from reproductions could have been left on the shroud. And that's why we can see those uh, traces of red ochre or vermilion. And it's funny, and you know if you've been listening to this series, that I'm a non-believer, perhaps. Uh, it, it's safe to call me an atheist, even though I tend to try to duck and maneuver around labels. Uh, maybe you can even call me severely uh, agnostic, 99% agnostic, maybe, I don't know. Um, and then of course I had that whole discussion about the overlap between agnostic and atheist and how neither would try to claim that they knew 100%, uh, that there was no God or that they could prove a hundred percent that there wasn't. Um, but it's funny that shroud is kind of one of those things where I'll be very firm in my disbelief and it, maybe it shows how gullible we are, or at least I am. And I'll find myself watching a special on the Shroud or something, and, and near the end, I'm like, oh, no, do I have to rethink everything? Am I wrong? But then after, you know, my head clears and I apply some reason, um, even though I admire the Shroud for its tenacity and its ability to withstand criticism and all the skeptical uh, attacks launched at it, um, at the end of the day, I do lean towards the fact, uh, and it makes sense since I'm a non-believer, that it probably is man-made. And, and I think one of the big things for me, and, and it's a simple thing, but it, but it it's uh, a big point, is that maybe not that the proportions are off, but the proportions are too good in a way that... Um, if the cloth was actually wrapping a human body, and then there's this great release of energy or some kind of mechanism that allowed uh, an impression to form, then we should also have an impression of the sides of the body. But if you look at the shroud, you know, you unfold it, we have uh, the front of the body basically perfectly proportioned in the sense that if you were to draw the outline of someone, those would be the proportions and the back. But where is the side? You'd think that if it wrapped a three-dimensional body and then you unfolded the cloth and looked at the image, the image should actually look distorted. You should see distortion around the head and the rest of the body from where the portion of the image that was formed by the sides of the body continue out. So they would maybe make the head look too wide or the arms too wide or something like that because you're seeing the side portions of the image. But when you look at the shroud, you don't really see the side portions. I don't know what a, um, what a religious counter argument to that point might be. They might try to say, oh, maybe the energy just shot out, you know, straight forward and straight backward or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, but when you look at that sort of thing and also in addition to the carbon dating results, 
I think it is probably most likely that is just a um, a man-made uh, religious relic. And um, relics were obviously revered in the Middle Ages. They're also a good way for new churches to uh, create revenue by um, attracting uh, traveling pilgrims, etc. But either way, I, I love the mystery. You know, I, I might be a skeptic, um, I might be a non-believer, but I love weird stuff. I love um, anything that has to do with the supernatural, the occult, cryptozoology. Uh, don't really believe any of it, but I'm absolutely fascinated and riveted by it. Um, but, you know, I think it's good to have some mystery. Uh, kind of keeps you on your toes, keeps you thinking and wondering. And I hope science continues to research the Shroud. Uh, I know the church can be pretty guarded about how often it allows the Shroud to be um, investigated and, uh, and its choice of who they let investigate it. But hopefully with the remaining samples or with some more non-invasive techniques, uh, perhaps using modern technology to examine the image through the hermetically sealed glass or whatever, uh, we might learn some more about it. And uh, maybe someday we'll be able to put it to bed and you know, discover once and for all if the carbon dating was accurate or if there's some chance that it is earlier, perhaps it does even go back to the first century. I can't believe I'm saying that and I'm hosting a uh, atheist podcast, <laughs> but who knows? Uh, let's keep on guessing and studying and researching and hopefully uh, we'll get to the truth. Wow, 37 minutes in. I think this has been the longest episode so far. Um, so I think that's it for the Week in Doubt Shroud of Turin Spectacular. And until next time, this is Philip Anthony Albertelli. As always, thanks for listening.